Thank you. Thank you, Jan Padmini, for a wonderful session. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Radhe Radhe, everyone. Good morning, good evening to all of you. A very warm welcome to today's edition of Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita. Uh, hope all you all of you are doing great. And uh, always good to be back these sessions. So let me share my screen. We will get started with our opening prayers like we always do. So let me share it. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, we'll start with our opening prayers. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwar Ha, Guru Sakshat Par Brahma, Tasmai Shri Guru Venama. Vasudev Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanur Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening, everyone. So let's get started. Today is Thursday. So Thursday we pick up some topic, um, more of a supplement. We we pick up the, you know, we go verse by verse over the week and Thursday uh, either we have a game or we pick up a supplemental topic to augment our learning around the key concepts. So today I picked up a topic related to faith. Uh, what is the significance of faith on this journey and how important it is and have like always, we'll take inspiration from Bhagavad Gita shlokas and uh, try to understand, go a little deeper. And today we don't have the soul soup segment. We pick up this topic because uh, today we're going to have the cash, uh, cash spiritual cash up segment uh, during the later part of uh, this session. So let's get started with the topic of faith. Importance of faith. Now, um, Bhagavad Gita 4.39 says, Shraddhavan Labate Gyanam. Those whose faith hit deep and who have practiced controlling their mind and senses attain divine knowledge. So faith has been called out. It is a very, very important ingredient on the path of spirituality. In fact, spirituality is a journey of faith only. Empirical evidences would come realize through realizations, but do you need faith, which is called Shraddha? or Nishtha on this path. Then you will say faith is blind and it's focus pocus stuff, right? We'll talk, try to understand, okay? Faith, uh, what is the importance of faith even in our material life from that standpoint, right? And is there truly anybody without faith? Also, Bhagavad Gita says, if you don't have faith, like let's say you are very, very skeptical. So the difference between faith and um, doubt and being skeptical is the, you know, the level of knowledge you have or the level of faith you have the level of faith you have because of the knowledge the faith varies whether it's a doubt or a skepticism in both of them now the worst thing that can happen is who have neither faith nor knowledge it is like having a neem ki chutney with karele ka achar, right both bitter things mm -hmm. neither knowledge nor faith so it is a path for self destruction so what bhagavad gita says in 4.40 is so one who is an ever-doubting nature for everything, it's okay to have, you know, even Arjun is asking questions to Lord Krishna. He's not, you know, but that is a with the spirit of submissive spirit with an trying to understand and with an open mind. But if you're asking questions with a very skepticism and cynical approach, it is a Samchyatma. And then Lord Krishna is saying, people who have neither faith nor knowledge and are of doubting nature, what happens to them? They suffer a downfall. And for the skeptical souls, there is no happiness either in this world or the next. So in this life also, they will suffer. And in the lifetime also, because that skeptical nature will be transferred over right, as part of their mm -hmm. sanskars. That is how, how you know, disadvantageous it is if we are of a skeptical nature, especially when it comes to 
believing in the knowledge that our scriptures are imparting or on the words of Guru. Now, um, the moment you talk about faith, you know, it's immediately our mind repels and says, faith, faith is blind, right? And faith is the, the religions and spirituality. It's all hocus pocus stuff that we are talking about. When you talk about faith, it's like you, you are telling us to put your thinking hat, you know, throw away your thinking hat and simply accept things on the face value. And that is not what we have learned in science. And that's just not a good way to approach anything at all. The moment this word faith comes. So let's try to understand this a little bit, right? I mean, this is very convenient argument your mind would present to you, especially youngsters mm -hmm. or anybody. I mean, I don't want to be a stereotypical. It can happen. Uh, immediately, this thing would come in our mind. But let's try to understand how the world operates. Now, when you board a flight, do you check the certificates of a pilot or something? You are le taking a leap of faith, right? This guy who's driving the plane is going to take you safely from point A to point B. Doesn't it require a bit of leap of faith there as well? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a joke that this guy, you know, the, the aeroplane starts becoming turbulent. So then they, in order to, uh, you know, calm down the passengers, they start offering snacks and drinks, right? So until the guy who, who wanted to have a drink means intoxication so that he can feel a little peaceful in that kind of a situation. So the air hostess goes and says, okay, so would you like to have this drink? He said, no, something different. He said, another one. He said, no, something different. Another one, no, something different. He said, oh, which drink do you need? He said, I need the same drink that the pilot has had, you know, while driving this plane. So anyway, it was turbulent weather. That is how he thought. But the point here is we also take a leap of faith when we are driving. And then this, in the same turbulent weather, people were panicking and there was a little girl who was casually playing her, you know, happily playing her video game. So our co-passenger asked her, are you not worried? You know, what's going on? Everybody's panicking. Are you not worried? She said, no, I'm not. I said, why? He said, because my father is the pilot. Okay, he will take us safely home. So the point here is whether it, you, know, you have that level of faith or not, but you are taking a leap of faith even when you are going on a plane, right? So it takes a leap of faith. Let's move on. When you go to a restaurant, you're also taking a leap of faith there that you know the waiter is not going to serve you something poisonous or otherwise. Who knows? You are at the mercy of waiter and pretty much all the people who are serving you, whatever, right? They say never pick up a fight with a waiter. They can do funny things with your food, okay? You are pretty much at their mercy. There also you are taking a leap of faith. Now, how about when you go to a barber and get your hair cut? Taking a leap of faith is not going to put the scissor at the wrong place. You know, it's a pretty precarious uh, situation if he, you know, a few inches here and there. How about going on a highway? When you're driving, you're taking a leap of faith that the person who's going to overtake you or, you know, is not a nutcase who's going to drive into you or ram into you, you're taking a leap of faith there as well. How about uh, a scholar? You know, I, have, I know it all kind of a people you have, you know, come across people, wise people who would say, don't give me all this stuff. I just know. They have it all figured it out. Ikea syndrome. I know it all. Now, you would say, what faith? They are also take a faith on their intellect. That their intellect, whatever they have grasped is perfect. And there's nothing more to be known. Okay. So, so And all the wisdom that is there to be acquired, they've already gotten into, into their uh, two inches worth of intellect. So what are they? They are also putting faith on their intellect. Are they without faith? Of course not. How about scientists? They are also taking a leap of faith. You know, the, the scientists, they build on the discoveries of others and then take, uh, that is how they keep on building on the theories. And it is also a big, huge leap of faith they are taking because whatever is evident at given point in time, that becomes the truth. Isn't that a leap of faith as well? And somebody, then somebody conclusively says there is no God, that is the biggest leap of faith anybody can take. Why? Because can we prove, the, do we know anything and everything out there in this universe? Answer is no. We all know that, right? We don't even know about our solar system. Forget about knowing the entire Brahman or the whole of Brahmans. Because if you think hypothetically, even if there is one thing you don't know, that could be God. So for you to conclusively say there is no God, it is a huge leap of faith somebody is taking, right? So point here that I'm trying to make is we have to take a leap of faith. Without faith, it's like we walk by faith and not by sight. That is what our scriptures tell us as well. Yes, Sandhya, you had a question?
faith is important to for you to operate effectively in this world and this is a journey of faith even in the spiritual realm as well but this is an intelligent faith not a blind faith because it has to be corroborated by three filter test what is the three filter test scripture said the multiple saints have said the same thing it's not like they have contradicted the other and the guru is telling that and then the fourth, the proof is in the pudding. The biggest test is you experiment, you implement those principles and see the results and then you can say that it is an intelligent faith. So yes, faith is needed to begin with, uh, but then there is a basis for that faith as well. So faith is required, absolutely needed. Yes, Sandhya, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, it was around this only that uh, though in all of these cases, there is some degree of faith, but again, here also, it's not totally blind faith. It's there is a system uh, based upon which they have put their faith on different yeah. things. You just trust the system. Like, for example, you would trust that somebody is not hired as a pilot, you know, another person without any... Or you, you look know, at the ratings of the flight proven, airlines and stuff. No, without yeah. proven credentials, right? Somebody is not... A, and then you take a leap of faith with, you know, people have not said that they've been served poison in this restaurant, right? Or they to take a leap of faith that uh, we didn't hear that this barber killed anybody. Today, that person may have a bad day, but then you still take a leap of faith, right? Because you assume that, in, but when it comes to spirituality, we have a lot of questions. We start putting question mark at everything. So there also faith is needed because that is why I said you, when you have a three filter test, scriptures are saying it, saints are saying it, gurus saying it, you implement it and see it for yourself. Then also it's the same approach you can apply here as well. But in material world, we are willing to take that, uh, you know, leap of faith, uh, but when it comes to spirituality, there's a bit of a, you know, skepticism that creeps in. So a guy is very hungry. Like I've given you that example of, you know, who's very fond of Rasgulla or Gulab Jamun. He's, he's very hungry. He's been fasting. And all day he was thinking, okay, when can I sink my teeth into that hot Gulab Jamun at the end of my fast? Now, the moment he's trying to get it to his, you know, the fast is ending and he gets a hot Gulab Jamun and he cannot wait to devour it. Just about when he's have, going to have it, one person says, hey, there's a poison in it. Immediately, he'll throw it away. Of course, his intellect has kicked in, which is going to tell the mind that it is not safe for you. So even though his mind is telling him, intellect has overruled it. But the point here is, does he know that person? Does he know that this guy is, you know, Harish Chandra, who will always speak a truth, but then say, who or why to take a chance? Let me put a faith on him. And so we put faith on so many things in life on friend, on Yelp reviews, on everything. But when it comes to spirituality, um, there's a bit of a shortcoming there. And that is where we have to exercise similar kind of a faith. But it's an intelligent faith where we say it's not something, um, you know, you're going by your own reviews and you know, Googling and, and WebMD and those kind of things. But it is coming from Guru. It is coming from scriptures. It is something which has been corroborated by multiple saints. That is a good enough reason for you to take a leap of faith in the path of spirituality. Now let's understand categories of faith. What are the categories of faith? Let's uh, see what are those. The first one is knowledge that strikes us as truth, strikes us as truth on first hearing. Okay, that is the first category. It can strike you as a truth for some reason. You have sanskars. It's like you might be reclaiming that knowledge. So it's like yeah, it makes sense. First time it just makes sense. That is one way to acquire faith. The second is knowledge that strikes us as truth after contemplation and discussion. So there will be a lot of concepts that will click when you keep joining the sessions or keep listening to videos, uh, contemplate upon, ruminate upon that knowledge, which is called Nididhyasan, when your intellectually says, you know what, it kind of makes sense. Finally, with of course, with God's grace, it will click. So that is another way of acquiring faith. The third way or the third category is knowledge that we realize after years of practice and purification. You know it, Janna Manna cap. So that realization can happen only after years of practice and purification, and then that faith will get developed. Other than that, that it will be like, uh, kuch, um, kuch uh, sanche, kuch gyan. What is that? Uh, kuch shraddha, kuch dushtata, kuch sanche, kuch gyan, ghar ka rahana ghat ka, jyon dhobi ka swan. So it can happen as well, right? But then, when you continue on this path, after a few days, there will be some realization. You say, you know what? Used to hear that. Now it kind of makes sense. It could happen five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, so it could take time as well. 
And then the fourth category is knowledge that we may never understand or realize. Okay, may never understand. It is, it can, it's like um, some of these things, you have to take it on the face value. Now, if I tell you Hanumanji could fly over a mount, you know, over a sea holding a mountain and when Bharat shot him and he fell down and then again, he put him back in arrow and again shot him up on the sky and then he reached, uh, you know, just in time for the Sanjeev, with the Sanjeevani booty. How will you understand? Your intellect will completely reject that theory, right? So, knowledge that you'll never understand or realize, take it on the face value, right? Our scriptures are like a cooked rice, I've said. Part of it is cooked, rest of it is cooked as well. You don't taste each grain of rice one by one. It is cooked, it is cooked, this is cooked. No, just as we went. So that knowledge will always be there. Just take it on the face value. Because if, you, if you're going to wait for all the concepts to be clear to you and then only you'll take a leap of faith, that is being very naive. That is not how it works. Okay. Yes, Sandhya, you wanted to say something? Um, there is a question in the chat from Kamala Ji. What is the difference between faith and trust? Faith and trust. I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe somebody can answer that. I think faith leads to trust. When you have, uh, like, when you have faith on God, it would lead to trust. Or maybe somebody can take that over. Or is it just the semantics we are talking about? Both are mutually reinforcing. Um, that's the best I could think on the fly. But maybe somebody can chime in or we can come back to that question. Actually, uh, when you have faith on God, you can trust God, right? I think probably faith leads to trust. Or when you trust somebody, um, I don't know, you would have, would you I, have faith in them as well? Trust on somebody. Trust is Vishwas and faith is Shraddha, right? Shraddha and Nishtha, yeah. So, yeah. Vishwas, so maybe it's the trust which precedes faith. Faith is more deeper. Uh, faith is deeper, that is right, because Shraddha is a deeper thing. Let's talk about it. Maybe it will get answered in a the next few slides. So, now... What do the scriptures say? Faith is a big thing. What can faith do? What can faith do? The Bible says that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Okay, that is what Bible says. And Kathopanishad simply says, if you have faith, you will attain God. Now, I had asked this question. So, if you see, do you see the mountain is moved? This is how the faith can move a mountain. By the way, um, I think I'd ask this question that uh, who all believe in God here? Can you raise your hand? I mean, it's a pretty slam dunk question. That is why we are here, right? Okay, Palji, you believe in God? That's good to know. This is very heartening to know that you all believe in God. Now, let me tell you um, what our scriptures say. Our scriptures say that if you truly believe in God, you would realize God. Okay, so we are work in progress. We are still trying to have that complete faith. Our scripture says, the day you will believe in God, you will realize God. There is absolutely not even a nanosecond difference. I believe in God, you will realize God. That is how this process goes. So, um, we are trying to build faith. And that is the journey that we are on. But the day this, uh, uh, you know, we are able to um, develop that faith that is needed in God. You know, when you truly start believing that you are carrying that the creator of this universe, the architect of my destiny, the, you know, the very basis of my life here inside you, the day you will believe that you will realize God. There is absolutely no difference between believing and realizing God. This is what our scriptures say. It is a very powerful statement. But if you think about it, this is, this is what faith can do. The day you will believe it will happen. We have tons of stories in our scriptures where... You know, people who are very innocent and they take the word either through, you know, um, their the word of their guru or they have heard from somebody and they believe in it. God has actually manifested. He has no choice but to manifest. Right? Even uh, the story of that thief I had told who, who was listening to the story of, uh, you know, that person who... Um, who has adorned with peacock feather and so many jewels and stuff like that. He just listened to that story and he said, he thought, okay, like rather than me doing petty thefts, if I can lay my hand on this person, I'll get all the jewels in one shot. He had faith. He believed it. That, and Krishna actually gave him darshan. That's a different thing when people see Krishna is so beautiful, they forget why they had come there for. But the point here is faith can uh, move mountain. That is what Bible says as well. And that is what our scriptures are telling us as well, right? So, faith is a key ingredient on this path. Now, let's move on. Uh, I think we've spoken about faith 
in every walk of life, I think it's important to remember this in anything that we do, whether we are taking a journey, whether we go to a restaurant, when we are driving, we are taking a leap of faith. Even when we walk out on the road, we take a leap of faith that the next driver is not going to run me over, right? So there's an Im implicit faith at the back of our mind. Of course, it's backed with some knowledge. Um, now, don't be skeptical on that faith. I get that. But there is a faith um, based on something that we take a leap of faith in so many things. Then let's look at you know, how do we build faith in our scriptures? When we're reading Bhagavad Gita, when somebody picks up for the first time, there's a basic level of faith, right? He may, he, she may think that, you know, if this book has some wisdom that is appreciated all around the world. So this is how it starts. It must have some substance. What is it? I want to know about it, right? So, Shraddhavan Labhate Gyanam. This is the shloka that says, so you have a little bit of, it's not a Shraddha as yet, but something is there, some kind of a trigger is there where for you to even come and listen to this knowledge or invest time in it, there is a bit of a thing, yeah, yeah, kind of makes sense kind of thing. This is what it need. And rest you can leave to God for, you know, making this spark into a full-blown fire in due course of time. It will automatically happen. All you need is that spark, initial spark, and see the universe, the floodgates of the universe opening up after that. Okay, this is how this process goes. In fact, I'm sure a lot of you can vouch for it that when you started making spirituality or seeking some of these answers, your priority, it is almost like the universe starts conspiring to give you answers. Either it will come through some, uh, you know, some person or something that you read or something somebody tells you or all of a sudden a video will pop up or somebody, some session you will, you know, hear exactly what you wanted to hear. It will just start opening up. Okay, this is how this process unfolds because God is already waiting. Now you have started to prioritize something which was always the intent of this creation. The moment you start prioritizing, God says, all right, thank you for freeing up my hands. Now I'm going to bombard you with the message that you're truly seeking. This is how the process unfolds. Yes, Rahul. Uh, Radhe, Radhe. Uh, where Radhe. is a comment from Ganpriya Ji? Can we go to the previous slide where you had the total, uh, the categories of faith? I think she wants to take... Categories of faith, sure. So these are the four. Uh, that is, I said, knowledge that strikes the truth for the first hearing, then something that you require to contemplate and discuss a lot, something that requires practice and purity for you to that concept to click to you, and something would be there that you will never understand or realize, but you have to take it on the face value, right? For example, there are there will be questions that you can ask God when you become God realized. There will be questions. It's not that you will get all the answers. It's very difficult to crack God's head. If you could crack God's head, that means you there is no difference between you and God. That means you are at par with God. That means you are God realized. So that difference, some difference would be there always. It's not that we will get all the answers for everything. So we have to preempt that as well in our head and continue to progress because in due course of time, even those things will click with God's grace or they may may not even you know when you become realized that's when you'll get some of those answers as well but the top three categories that we have spoken about these are the ones we need to focus on and continue to progress on this path and we may not know all the answers it's that journey it's like a two mile journey you take with a lantern will you see all the two miles in the night you cannot then what do you do do you stop the journey no so you you pick the lantern you start walking you see 20 yards you travel those 20 yards then as you reach, did you see the next 20 yards and then the next and next and then the whole journey you can complete. This is how this, this journey is. The journey of faith goes from understanding to understanding, not from doubt to doubt. Okay, so this is how it's supposed to unfold. Um, it's like we don't wait for all the signals to turn green before we get a step out of our house. We go and then, you know, signals will do their own stuff, we, but we continue to march forward. Okay, now what faith can do? We've already spoken about that. Okay, now let's get to our last slide. We know. So level one, what are the different levels of faith? Level one, I believe in God. Many people have faith that God exists. That's all. They may say he exists, but I don't bother much about him. This is normal theism. We don't bother. Yeah, we know I'm religious. I do my puja and that's about it, right? I do my thing and beyond that, they don't want to contemplate or go deeper. This is level one. Level two is God exists and he loves me. That's an advanced stage. Okay, You say God exists and he loves me. There's a difference between the first and second, right? And level three is God exists and he loves me. I love him too. And the perfection of my life is to serve him. 
that is the ultimate perfection of life that is the purpose of our existence now this level 3 is called shraddha deeper faith okay so it's a journey of course and then we all are at a different trajectory but we need to move towards a level 3 aspect of it and keep on deepening it i'm not saying this is where it ends now there could be a session in itself on what are the levels of faith you know nishtha shraddha gaat there are different levels so we could probably discuss it as part of our sessions when we discuss the different levels of bhakti but at least you got an idea how important this ingredient faith is on this path because if you are skeptical or and of ever doubting nature then we will get uh, we will not get happiness neither in this life either in this life or in the life thereafter and it is a self destruct path is what lord krishna is saying na lokosti na paro sukham you cannot attain happiness if you are of ever doubting nature for everything it's good to have faith and this faith is back it's kind of an intelligent faith where you are putting faith not just like okay it's like like i said there's a three filter test for that scriptures say that multiple saints say that and your guru has said that as well and then of course you can realize it by experimenting and impl implying those principles right so the irony of human life is that they say that in kanpur or for that matter or even in in bharat you know the dogs they bark a lot at night so in uh, usually in big cities what happens is when when one starts barking the rest join the party they also start barking because they they trust that this fellow comrade of mine is barking because it must have seen something which is not you know supposed to be seen at night maybe thief or something so they trust and start barking join the party but with humans different people have said the same truth over and over again over and over again and we still don't trust okay so this is a journey of faith and faith has to be deepened and then how do we deepen the faith with proper knowledge ramayan says janu binu hoy na pratiti binu pratiti na hoy priti knowledge leads to faith and faith leads to love and when you love somebody automatically you will be surrendered right when we love somebody aren't we surrendered to our kids or people whom we love this is how the process unfolds okay with that let's take maybe a couple of questions before i hand it over for the next question i see a few hands maybe a bit of a discussion for next 5 6 minutes before uh, we move to the cash up segment there is a question from samiran ji that uh, does realizing god in the lifetime is a part of a person's prarabdh no if it is part of prarabdh then you will wait so krishna would have said you know what wait for the right life where i'll give you the prarabdh which will lead you to god realization he didn't say that so even god doesn't know when we will god realize because he's left it up to your free will um like in bhagavad gita he says right um yathechasi tatha guru now that i've given you the knowledge you decide what is right and wrong for you so no it's not dictated by our prarabd we have to make efforts yes uh, it is dictated by prarabd to the extent that you in one of your lifetimes if especially if you have made spirituality a priority you may get favorable circumstances but that does not guarantee that you will complete the journey in that lifetime it's like a deck of cards that you are dealt with with good hands you can lose with bad hands you can win it's your free will how you exercise in a particular life yeah hope that answers your question radhe radhe manoranjan ji yes manoranjan ji uh, radhe radhe am am i audible yes 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 please. yeah i have a, actually i have a question this may be off beat the question is that in this shloka lord krishna is saying डाउटिंग नेचर यू कैन नॉट बी हैपी यू नॉट गुड गेट आंसर्स यूल ऑलवेज विद क्लोज माइंड एंड ऑलवेज कीप ऑन reconfirming your bias or doubt so you will not attain happiness in this life that is lokosti na paro means life thereafter okay paro means thereafter the next life or next lifetimes that's essentially what it means i hope that that answers your question okay uh so yeah la lokosti in this life or thereafter thereafter means coming lifetimes because mind is the same right we have to tackle it either we tackle it now 
or after two years or five years or ten years or next lifetime or next lifetime or next lifetime somewhere we'll have to tackle it ourselves only yes they just uh, you wanted to say something yeah so i actually had uh, read read it read somewhere like lord krishna says right, to arjuna right like you know you start from sankhya yoga to karma yoga to bhakti yoga to ultimately attaining gyan yoga and he says the ultimate knowledge is the realization of parmatma and that is the brahma vidya so i think like when you told about faith like ultimate goal of anyone who's um, who's living as a human is ultimate is the god realization right so that is the ultimate knowledge true which he calls it as brahma vidya correct correct me if i'm wrong yeah yeah brahma vidya god realization that is true it's like knowing god means god realization and that can happen through the grace of god only but what you're talking about we'll talk about that topic in fact lord krishna tells arjun i'm going to give you three guhya this confident guhyatar and guhyatam guhya guhyatar and guhyatam okay and i'll map it to which three yogas you are talking about how he has explained it so he said i'm going to give you the confidential knowledge more confidential knowledge and the most confidential knowledge is what lord krishna has said and the most we will talk about that i'll map it to the different yogas that you have spoken about um how he has presented it and why he has he has said that this is a very confidential knowledge But and yeah. he also says it in the, he also says it in the same order he says it in sankhya yoga to karma yoga to bhakti yoga to ultimately attaining gyana yoga yes. so, so i don't know if there is a relevance in the order also yeah there is a relevance in the order also and i'll, I'll explain which one he is calling the most confidential out of these right it all starts with the analytical the sankhya yoga aspect of it that answers the question get to know thyself who are you first of all we are thinking of ourselves as a body let's start with the fundamentals okay you are a soul not mm-hmm. this body and then he starts the w- art of science how no science of work how should we approach mm-hmm. work right and then he goes about getting into the depths of bhakti and gyan as well right gyan leads to bhakti bhakti leads to gyan and finally he talks about it's all bhakti gyan has a peak but then bhakti does not have a... so we'll talk about that but yes that is how he step by step goes on step to step by step yeah maybe i, I like can do that, a session yeah. of a big long condensed course on bhagavad gita although see, this is a 10 year project maybe maybe a week <laughs> a week long uh, course on bhagavad gita so that we understand the whole how this oh, this whole knowledge unfolds you I, know i yeah i just love that line that's why i remembered it and i just uh... Of, yeah, okay so thank, maybe thanks. one more Sorry. one more question we can take sandhya and then uh, i wanted to give about 20 25 minutes uh, so i think we're closing in on 935 for the next segment because you're going to get a lot of you know uh, basically concepts that will come up so i want to give sufficient amount of time quick real quick sandhya um so knowledge should lead to faith but there are cases where it just remain theory- theoretical and doesn't Uh, lead to faith or is it i mean first of all is it possible that it cannot uh, and how can that be settled or sorted uh, settled and sorted what like for example tota right we have talked about this like if there was this particular parrot who knew that he was not supposed to get trapped he kept on repeating it but it ended up getting trapped so that knowledge just remained an information which it was repeating but did not really become realized knowledge yeah that's true and when the throat of the tota is choked it will say tar knowledge will not come out very true because that knowledge remains as an information unless it becomes a realization but yeah we can continue on that discussion let's move on to the next segment uh, over to you cash i'm going to stop share now ஒரு The first blind man happened to touch the ear of the elephant and he said, "Oh, this elephant is just like a fan." The second blind man happened to touch the tusk of the elephant and he thought, "Actually, it is long and pointy just like a spear." The third blind man touched the trunk of the elephant and he said, 
this is long and wiggly, it's like a snake. The fourth blind man happened to touch the side of the elephant, right, which is smooth and broad and thick. And he said, I disagree. The elephant is like a wall. The fifth blind man touched the leg of the elephant and he said, are you all blind? It's obvious the elephant is like a pillar. And the last blind man happened to touch the tail of the elephant and thought it's very much like a rope. And he thought everybody else is wrong. So the point of this story is, if we're only looking at a particular selective perspective, we lose out on the big picture and we lose out on integrated teachings. And so the takeaway from this story is that it is important to have a holistic perspective and keep everything in mind as we try to assimilate information. So let's keep this takeaway in mind as we move on to today's topic. Hurry up and let go. Uh, and this is a continuation on our topic of surrender. Today's episode four. So let's get into it. Um, we'll start with a quick recap and rumination, like one of Krishna's cows. So in previous couple of episodes, we talked about what is the big deal about surrender and what will I get from surrendering? You and I both. Um, so the takeaway we saw was the moment we achieve that 100% surrender is when we'll get the ultimate grace and divine bliss, right? And we did a quick um, segue from that topic to talk about what do we mean by that 100% surrender and what happens during that journey. And we talked about these causeless graces from our guru. First one being that the guru appears in our life. That in itself is a big blessing. Secondly, they allow us to understand the tattva gyan. They adopt us, keep us on their radar, they're monitoring our progress, warning us of pitfalls. And finally, when we reach that 100% surrender, uh, they award us with um, divine bliss. That is what we looked at as part of what is surrender. Then we also looked at what it actually means to surrender and what does it not mean to surrender. So we said it is not an action that you perform. It is not something you say with your mouth. It is certainly not a worldly transaction because you're exchanging something imperfect and limited for something that is perfect and um, unlimited. And so we said, what is surrender? We said it is a state of consciousness. It is a state of being. And it means coming to a state of doing nothing. And this part is kind of where we're going to focus on today. So today we'll look at what exactly is to be surrendered. And then, uh, and that is because God is looking for very one very specific thing. Um, and then we'll also look at what does it take to surrender. So we've been talking about what should we do in practical life? What does it mean when we want to surrender? So we'll look at all of the self-effort that's that goes into the surrender journey. So that will be our area of focus today. All right, let's get into it. Um, as a quick reminder, because we are talking about the state of doing nothing, we looked at um, Maharaj's beautiful example of a mother and a newborn baby in terms of the doership. So we map this blue part to the mother's doership percentage and the yellow part to the child's doership. And we said for a baby that's just born, it does absolutely nothing. It can take care of, it cannot take care of itself whatsoever. So the mom is doing everything for that helpless little baby. And as it's growing up, it starts to do more and more for his own. So like a school child is probably dressing himself and um, is able to do you know simple tasks for himself. The older the child gets, is becoming more and more independent and the mom is having to do less and less until this child is a grown-up person and can handle life completely on their own. And mom is probably there just for moral support. So then Maharaji says, as long as a newborn baby does nothing, the mother does everything for it. When the child starts doing something, the mother lessens her responsibilities to that same extent. And then when the child begins to do everything, then the mother does nothing. So the situation is reversed. So this example, he says, fully explains what surrender is. And he said, to, to be able to do that, we have to reverse this equation and go back to how we were when we were in that state of helplessness when we want to depend on God for everything. We said that that kind of is a state of surrender, right? 
Um, so that's what we mean by the state of doing nothing. Now, Maharaji has another example uh, on similar lines of letting go. So now he's talking about what is that effort to come to a state of doing nothing or to come to that state of letting go. So he says, as long as a bird has a piece of food in its beak, it's going to get noisily pursued by other birds that are after that piece of food. And that's why this bird has not a moment's peace. But then as soon as that bird drops that piece of food, it's let it go. Then it gets that piece immediately because now the birds are not interested in him any, in it anymore because the, the birds are interested in the food, right? So in the mom and baby example, we talked about coming to a state of doing nothing. And here we're talking about a state of letting go. So then are we saying surrender is as easy as doing nothing, letting go? Is that all it means? So we know in life, we juggle so many things, right? We, we, are, we have work to focus on, we have families, we have responsibilities, so many things that we're trying to do. So are we saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, do you mean I can just drop everything and let it go? And is that what surrender literally means? So let's look, uh, let's look at what that surrender actually is. So when we do things, right, we have a body and we have a mind. With the body, we're using senses and our body to perform our physical duties and activities. Those are the actions we perform with our body. With our mind, the action that we're performing is the mind is generating thoughts and desires, right? But also we have a higher mind, which we refer to as the intellect. And the intellect is processing those thoughts and desires and it's discerning and it's making decisions based on the thoughts that the mind is producing. Now, Maharaji says that the unalterable spiritual law is that one's attainment will either be spiritual or material according to the attachment of one's mind and not according to one's physical actions. So we are saying if we physically engage in worldly duties, but keep our mind attached to God, then we will not have to bear the fruits of our physical actions. Instead, we will only receive spiritual results because our attachment of our mind is to God and devotional things. And this was the crux of, we spoke at length, um, chapter four on Karmio. This is all we talked about, is that it doesn't matter what you're physically doing, as long as your mind is attached in God and devotion. So, unequivocally all the scriptures and um, all our divine knowledge is telling us what what is it that we're having to surrender it is our mind and intellect that is that one specific thing god wants as part of the surrender so this is the important takeaway from from that part of the conversation and here's where the elephant story comes in we're saying surrender the mind and intellect come to a state of doing nothing we have to keep in mind that this is in terms of the mind and intellect. So we, when we look at the holistic perspective, it doesn't mean that you stop doing everything with your body and you just sit there. Um, because as a reminder, the Bhagavad Gita 2.47, we talk about how inaction is strongly condemned. And we have Arjun's example where he drops his weapons and he tells Krishna, I'm not going to fight this war. And Krishna tells him, you're not allowed to do that. That is a sin. Pick up your weapons and fight, but keep your mind fixed on me. And then you won't incur all of the um, bad karma that you think you're going to incur out of fighting the war. So again, take away here. What is that one thing that God wants us to surrender? It is the mind and the intellect. They're not interested in the body. So moving on, let's look at what effort it takes to do nothing. And before we look at the effort towards surrender, just want to talk about a couple of real world examples. Because again, when we talk about doing nothing and letting go, let's let's think about, you know, when you, you've heard of the concept of active listening, right? Listening just means you've got to be there and you just have to listen to someone, right? But what does it take to be a good active listener? 
first of all, you have to avoid the impulse to interject. You might be hearing something and it wants to make you interrupt or answer or ask a question, but as part of good active listening, you hold on. You have to, you have to avoid that impulse. Um, if someone's talking and talking, you, you have to prevent your mind from wandering. You have to pay attention. We have to show that we're listening. You have to give verbal or visual clues that you're listening. You provide feedback by facial expressions. And you differ from judgment. You want to hold on until the other person has said what they've said. And after, the, after the, everything's been said, then you respond appropriately. So all of these things you have to do as part of just active listening, which you can think about as just standing there and listening to someone. But in the background, you're doing all of this work. Another example, for someone who's just starting to learn how to meditate, how many people say it's so hard to meditate? Meditating is nothing but sitting in one place, doing nothing, supposedly, but it takes a lot of work even to do that and a lot of practice. Again, you have to avoid the impulse to fidget. The clothes that were fine all this long, they suddenly start to poke or they start to itch. Um, as Swamiji says, some people go into samadhi immediately, they fall asleep. Um, you have to learn to sit still. You have to focus on your breath. You get all these thoughts. You have to learn to de-identify from them. You just watch them go by, even if they're not stopping. You have to focus your attention on God. And your mind will keep wandering and you have to keep bringing it back. So on the outside, it feels like meditation, it's doing nothing, but so much hard work goes behind it. So point I'm trying to make is doing nothing also requires effort, right? So when we say surrender, do nothing, come to a state of doing nothing, being nothing, letting go, that's going to require some hard work. And so that brings us to this packed slide of the self-effort framework. Um, so the way I've thought about this is as we go about our day, right? Some things happen in the background, like an operating system. We have to constantly keep them in mind um, to make them a way of life. And then as you go about your day, um, we feed whatever we're learning into the things that we think about or do. Um, and life is day after day, it's a series of decisions. So that's where the decision-making comes in. Based on the decisions we're making is when is how we decide to perform the actions that we're performing and those actions give rise to results. So this is kind of the thought process behind this framework and let's walk through it. So we're all on this spiritual journey, right? We're, we're absorbing things. We come to this class, we have other avenues from which we're learning, we're reading articles, we're watching videos, um, we're doing stuff on, the Radha Krishna Bhakti app, hopefully. So all that is contributing to our spiritual journey. And from that, uh, we have learned that we need to have an attitude of deep gratitude for the existing graces that we have, right? So all of these bullet points here are practical tips that we can, we can incorporate in our daily life. And again, this framework is just a starting point. I'm sure there's other things we can add to this. Also, as part of our spiritual journey, our gurus have told us repeatedly, we talked about it even now a few minutes ago, um, stop using intellect to make sense of divine things because divine knowledge is not material. Our intellect is material and we cannot make sense logically of everything that we're listening, hearing, or learning. Then before we do anything, you know, we set intentions. Anything that materializes, is first a thought. So we can set some thoughts and intentions. First one being that prayer. Meri chahi mat karo, main mura ka gyan, te, teri chahi mein hai prahu mera kalyan. So that can be our daily intention and our you know, purpose behind doing everything. Um, we haven't looked at surrender principles yet. We'll, we'll look at that in a subsequent episode, but surrender principle one, is to desire in accordance with Guru's desire. And Maharaj says, this is the foremost and most important one um, to adhere to. And if we don't know what Guru's specific desire is, he says, just follow your Guru's teachings. You have them available. Now, like I said, these two things are sort of the operating system. 
that we're continuously doing anyway. And so these two things, as we keep growing and learning on our journey and setting these intentions, they're going to feed into our decision-making, right? Hopefully we're making better and better decisions. So as part of the decision-making, the things we can keep in mind is as much as possible, we avoid making decisions that are self-serving or egocentric. We try to bring that witness consciousness more and more to the fore by distancing ourselves from the mind. So reminding ourselves that I am not the mind. I don't have to do everything that the mind wants me to do. And the mind is just generating these thoughts and I can choose to de-identify from them. Also another reminder, the Paramatma is seated within us. Um, and so he's there watching, noting. And so that's another thing that can help us make better decisions. Once we decide on something, that's when we start to perform that action, right? We decide what action to perform. So when it comes to that, best thing um, we can do, I think, um, in terms of surrender is to keep 2.47 in mind. Uh, perform your action, do your self-effort, leave the results to God. You, we don't have rights over the results. Uh, that's one way, a big way of surrendering. Once we perform actions, obviously it will have consequences. So one could be getting favorable results. In that case, um, remind ourselves that it is God that illuminates our mind and intellect. We don't have capabilities on our own. And the second God decides to unplug that power supply, there's we, we don't even exist anymore. Um, so everything that we have, all the good that we're doing is coming from him and his graces. When we do good things, we attribute those to God and Guru's grace. But also, once you perform actions, you could have unfavorable results. And what we can do to keep in mind um, in those times is practicing prasad buddhi, which is accepting the results that we have um, received. And the other thing we can do is minimize our ego by attributing our mistakes to our own limitations. So when, when it's a good thing, attribute to God. When it's not a good thing, it's my fault. So this is sort of the framework um, in terms of practical tips for practicing surrender, self-effort. I'm sure we can add to this um, if we discuss further. So this was kind of the main takeaway from the second main takeaway take from today's segment, which brings us to applying the, this knowledge to make it real power. Um, so surrender is not going to be a one-time activity, right? It is going to be a journey and it's a practice we can deepen over time, especially if we make it a way of life. Um, and that framework is one way of incorporating it into our daily lives. So we can look at surrender as a sadhana, right? Um, where S is setting intentions for surrender. A is aligning our desires with the desire of God and Guru. D is distancing ourselves from the mind. Uh, practicing that witness consciousness. H is having an attitude of gratitude for existing races. A is attributing unfavorable results to God and Guru. N is negating self-serving ego-driven thoughts or decisions. And the last is accepting unfavorable results with Prasad Buddhi. So this was just a little acrostic. And I will leave you with this one thought. Hold on tight to the practice of letting go. And with that, we conclude today's segment of um, surrender. Thank you for your patience and attention. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Thank you, Kesh. Your, you know, your knack of presenting frameworks and putting all the tools together, it's uh, pretty amazing. So thank you for that. I can see a lot of hands, a lot of hearts already, so I would not steal their thunder and let them talk about it. Yes. Uh, Radhe Radhe, Sadna, amazing framework as well. Um, so one thing I wanted to add, uh, like as you said, there can be many other things that we can add in framework. So the last thing about unfavorable results, uh, in addition to accepting that it is coming out of our limitation, we can see that again as a grace, as an opportunity for growth that God and Guru have offered us, then, you know, with that solution, 
oriented mindset nothing is not grace everything is grace of god and guru so that was one thing i wanted to add and i think in the last slide by mistake there was a typo so uh, instead of favorable it was written unfavorable on maybe i think unfavorable yeah. you're right the, yeah the, i just wanted to point it out that it yeah yes, thank you i will correct it great let's hear from others as well um, any key takeaways anything any aha moments around uh, all the concepts that were encapsulated and presented uh, so concisely rahul is framing his punch lines already i can see that go ahead rahul yeah radhe radhe tanmay ji radhe 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 uh, am i audible yes you are very audible okay. so what i yeah. so whatever it, it was in the presentation i have experienced it not just one time multiple times and uh, thank you nitin ji for solving my doubts because i was very hesitated in asking such questions from swami ji so thank you sir was so sorry thank you so Just, much tanmay ji you keep yourself inspired and um, you know god and Guru's great blessings are with you. So sky's the limit. So just keep yourself motivated and inspired, and all good things will happen. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, do we have anybody else or any question for Cash? Let's uh, let's give her uh, uh, you know a little bit of questions as well to generate some more excitements on sadhana surrender. Samiran, you have to ask a question today. Okay, at least one question. Yes, Prakash is going to say yes. Go ahead, Prakash. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Yeah, it's Radhe. It's always it's a beautiful presentation once again. I love this uh, self-effort framework uh, from Kashdi. So I think uh, I'm going to print it and put it on my wall in my office so that it gives me a reminder always. And Sadhana's uh, that acronym thing explaining it is also very good. So you simply said surrender means doing nothing, but actually we have to do a lot of things, right? So, but in a in a direction, internal direction towards the God. Um, so whatever all the self effort things that you mentioned, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Doing nothing is takes a lot of effort, right? Yes. Yeah. If you have to become like a baby, of course it's a lot of effort, right? Because of our conditioned state right now. Yes, uh, Rahul, you wanted to add more? Yeah. Yeah, I just made two points. Uh, Radhe Radhe Govind Radhe. Sadhana ka framework Professor Cash the padha the Radhe Radhe. Professor Cash. Samiranji. Yeah. So PK PK is a good name. By the way, please fill out the feedback tracker. I think that was posted already. So do send your feedback on you know what you like today and what you'd like to see more of. Uh, so do take out some time for that as well, please. Yes, Samiran, go ahead, please. Yeah, like uh, surrender means what I feel is dissolving the uh, awareness of I. Like in anything and everything which we do, either in spiritual things or the material things, it, it a very common thing that we associate is that I am doing, I am doing. But uh, how to get above that state of surrender? Like uh, if I am telling that. I am surrendered to God. There is still I remaining there, right? So, how to get above that, or what to, uh, what is the higher lens that we can attain in the surrender part? There are six principles of surrender, right? If you look at the framework, so that doership aspect will also keep on going, right? When we said that we accept things. And we attribute all good things that get done by us to God, back to God, and we take ownership for our fault. So that I ego will keep on setting, getting set in perspective. It will diminish over time. And the more we purify, the more we are aligned to our constitutional position, which is that of being a fragmental part of God and being energized by God. And that state would automatically come as we keep on. Um, as we keep on progressing on this path and as as the layers of ignorance are removed from us. So, but we need ego. Right now we have that ego. I is there. Using that I, we keep working on that I until that I is set in perspective and over and over time it will diminish as well. It will keep on diminishing. For the current state of mind, we can 
just uh, attribute that I to the good things or the spiritual things that, that anything, will work, work. Anything good that gets done from us, we give credit back to God because He inspired rather than taking credit by ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Somebody, you don't say I helped somebody. It's like thank you God for enabling me to you know that get that help done. And but when something bad happens, you take at you know ownership for that. It was because of my imperfection that I ended up doing it. So you know that's how we progress on this path. So that I is always and, I is always yes, and also from the last uh, class that we discussed about uh, surrender, who oh, you told about the story of the criminal, right? Who was asked in the court that. Um, who inspired you to do that? He said, God inspired me to do that. So in that sense, is that a true surrender? Because his intention is no, wrong. And it's not true surrender. That person had not read Bhagavad Gita and the shloka that we are discussing. Okay, we don't end God. It's not a surrender where we, we basically, the way we exercise our free will, we attribute it back to God. It doesn't work that way. Okay. If he is truly surrendered, then why would God murder people? Right? It's like if if God was the inspirer, then nothing wrong will go in this world, right? Everything will be done perfectly. So we take ownership for our mistakes as opposed to attributing it back to God. But the day we are surrendered, then we can say God has taken control over us. So right now we are not. If Hanumanji is killing somebody, that is done in the spirit of surrender because he was doing it completely with a surrendered spirit to Ramji. If Arjun is killing people in the war, that is done with the spirit of surrender because he was simply following Krishna's instructions. But if a regular person goes on, on a rampage killing people and attributes it to God, that's an incorrect understanding. You know, that's an exercise of a free will in an incorrect way, invoke basically drawing upon bad karma. Yes, Patusha, maybe a minute each and then we'll wrap up our session for the day. Uh, tomorrow we have spiritual secret session around the same time. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Just wanted to remind that. Yes, Pratusha, go ahead. Uh, Radhe Radhe, everyone. Radhe Radhe, sir. So, uh, thank you, Kashi. Beautiful presentation. The images just, you know, gets and establish itself in our mind. Uh, so, um, the one of the uh, thing that we discussed here was uh, the state of doing nothing. So, uh, if we see that image or if we remember that image, uh, that baby is growing and becoming self-sufficient and is thinking that it knows everything it can do everything and like how sir said that hanmanji was doing things at the state of surrender so he was like a child at that point of time so uh my question here is about faith is faith and surrender same it leads to surrender Right. Surrender is, is it's, it leads to surrender. So if you don't have faith, you mean at least at that mind level, you think that you don't have and you just have surrender, still things work, right? So. If it is surrender, but you would have faith, right? Then only you will surrender. How, why would you surrender somebody without having faith on that? It's like a man, he was in Navy, naval officer, he, he was along with his wife. And the ship started, you know, to move around in a turbulent weather. I would, I, I, I would say it's ignorance probably, and because we are always in a perpetual state of surrender. We have a uh, faith, but it is just that we have to convince ourselves um, that you know it is not because of your abilities that you are getting something or you are achieving something. It is always based on some higher principle. Yeah. Whatever it takes, our intellectual convince that and align to that principle of surrender here. Whatever works, sure. Good. Thank you, Pratusha. Yes, Tejas. So, does surrender mean like samarpan? Like you know, uh, like Krishna Bhagwan says, like you know, uh, Karne Mahabharata. His his samarpan was towards his friend Duryodhan, and uh, that's why his uh, path was went in a, in a negative way and you know uh, in, in terms of arjun his samarpan was took towards krishna so does uh, samarpan and surrender in the same thing atma samarpan is surrender only but that comes towards the later stages right there are six principles of surrender okay mm -hmm. um, that is a topic in itself if you were discusses what is surrender we can talk about those six principles the first one is to desire in accordance with the desire of god Second is not to desire against the desire of God. Third one is to have attitude of gratitude. 
Fourth one is to have firm faith God is protecting us. Fifth one is not having a sense of proprietorship over anything in this world, right? My this, my that. And the last one is surrender the pride of having surrendered. So these are the six principles of surrender. Each one mm -hmm. is pretty deep and we can talk about that. If you practice all six, okay. that is what surrender is. Even when you are complaining about something in your head, that means you have not have acceptance. You have violated the principle of surrender. So if you are worried about something in... Sorry? So it encompasses all the six principles. All basically. the six principles. So it's a pretty deep concept. Okay. okay. It's not like if somebody puts a gun to your head and say, hey, hands up. He said, I'm surrendered. That is not surrender. Okay. It's a mm -hmm. way of life. But those principles are very deep. The moment you have worry or anxiety about future, you have violated the principle of surrender. The moment you think you become insecure that something is going to happen if my if I lose money or this happen, my job goes away. Principle of is the surrendered. It's a pretty profound state to be in. So those six principles say that we can have more discussion on that. There are six principles for surrender. So Anukul Sankalpa se pratikul varjitam, right? As scriptures tell us. So yeah, it's a concept in itself. Yeah. But we'll bring it to mm -hmm. session. So don't worry. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Hitinji. No worries. Maybe one more. We are already over time. Um, I don't know if we can have our maybe couple of chants today or we are already over short. Yes, Sandhya, you wanted to say something? Uh, Manisha Ji has asked a question. Uh, if someone is new on this path, can we tell them about the mirror window principle? Uh, or uh, should we, you know, avoid uh, at early stages telling them about this theory that attribute good to God and bad to yourself? You have to take a call around that, you know, how receptive that person is. So there's no harm in testing the waters and then feeding something. But then Krishna says that if you talk about, you know, me and people in front of other people, it could be counterproductive and it is not recommended. But talking about God, you have to take be very judicious about it. Not everybody is ready. And what can happen in the process is they may end up doing Nama Prat or spiritual transgression. And that might be counterproductive for their journey. So to save them, we should not talk about God or Guru and, and these concepts. Um, unless you think these people are receptive. There are people who are receptive, who come with an open mind. So you take a judicious call around it, especially bringing in a topic of God and stuff like that. But if you think somebody is, uh, you know, it could uh, give them a food for thought and check it out, test the waters before you go too far with these concepts in front of, you know, people, new people or strangers. So, uh, should I share the screen for devotional segment or? Yeah, you can do. We can take two hands real quick and wrap it up. I know today's our session, so it's good to end it with chants. So, let's do that because we are breaking out and tomorrow we will continue. I think, Tandar, we are going to discuss more on surrender, right? At the same time, the spiritual secret topic. So, please do plan to join that as well. Go yeah, ahead. that's Two hands today. Go ahead, Sandhya. We'll wrap it uh, up. Okay. Right? And then... <coughs> सबई शक्ति है नाम में मन निषिदिन आराध राधे राधे पैन ही शक्ति न लाभ दिन ये नाम अपराध राधे राधे जय राधे कृष्ण राधे राधे Radhi Krishna Radhi. You didn't put the translation today? Okay. Yeah. So we talk about spiritual transgression and here it comes. It's again a coincidence, right? Yeah. So O oh mind, uh, constantly chant the names of the Lord. Yeah. Which contain all his powers, but remember, one who commits a transgression towards the holy name cannot derive any benefit from these powers. Okay. What will be the transgression? That will be the question. Don't ask today. Okay. All right. Let's um, take maybe two hands. I see two. So let's take Palji. Go ahead. And then we'll take Riyaji and wrap it up for today. Uh, go ahead, please, Palji. Radhe Radhe Nitinji and everyone. सब शक्ति है नाम में मन निशी दिन आराध राधे राधे पैन ही शक्ति ने लाभ दिन किए नाम अपराध राधे राधे 
श्री राधे कृष्ण राधे 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 कृष्ण राधे जय श्री राधे Shri Radhe, thank you, Riya ji. Please go ahead. Last one for the day, and then we wrap up. Radhe Radhe. Radhe. Sab hai shakti hai naam me man nish din aradh Radhe Radhe. Pe nahi shakti na. लाभ तीन किए नाम अपराध राधे राधे जय राधे कृष्ण राधे 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 कृष्ण राधे थैंक यू राधे 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 वेरी नाइस सो थैंक यू अगेन एवरीवन फॉर योर एक्टिव पार्टिसिपेशन एंगेजमेंट एंड टर्निंग योर वीडियोस ऑन एंड थैंक यू कैश फॉर अनदर वंडरफुल सेशन लाइक ऑलवेज Uh, please do fill out the feedback tracker if not already and uh, have a great rest of your evening and a little break that we're going to have on friday tomorrow by the way we have the session around the same time but i look forward to um, seeing you back on sunday evening so radhe radhe good night good day from my side thank, thank you thank you nitin ji radhe radhe and don't forget about the swami mukundaran ji's exclusive live interaction with swami ji on the swami mukundaran exclusive platform so yeah radhe 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 Thank you.